Lord be with you. And also with you. We are delighted that you have gathered with us in worship today. We want to extend a special welcome to our guests and those who are worshiping with us online. As we gather today, God meets us right where we are. Whether we are enjoying the first incredible week of summer or whether we've had a difficult week, God meets us right where we are with open arms, ready to receive us on this day. As we gather for worship, we gather to celebrate Holy Communion where all are welcome. You will find some this morning that are wearing a similar cross. Many of us have been on a walk to Emmaus. If you're interested in that spiritual walk and growing in your journey, I invite and encourage you uh, to just ask us and we'll tell you more about that incredible opportunity. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Almighty and gracious God, as we gather this morning, we gather that we may be brought in and fill the embrace of your everlasting arms who continue to welcome and bring us in no matter what our journeys have been this week. Oh God, we give thanks that you are a God whose love is unconditional and immeasurable. Oh God, as we worship today, may we just overflow with appreciation and gratitude and that all that glory be reflected for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you have yet to do. Oh God, it's an opportunity that we experience your grace and mercy and worship today. May we not only experience it, but that we be transformed. That as we go out into this world, we can share that with those whom we encounter. Oh God, we lift our worship up to you this morning. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Let us lift our voices in song as we sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
may be seated. One week from today, we will begin hosting the Texas Annual Conference at our West Campus. This is an incredible opportunity where people from Matagorda to Texarkana, lay leaders and pastoral leaders of our United Methodist Churches will gather and celebrate what God is doing in and through the United Methodist Church. We have incredible worship throughout that entire time. We do a little bit of business, we have great meals, and we get to do the work together and remember that we are a connected and united church. Throughout this, entire throughout this entire conference is an opportunity for us to show the love and the joy, the excitement that we have of being part of First United Methodist of Houston. It's an opportunity to share the love that we have and the hospitality as guests come in every Sunday and they said, wow, that was an incredible experience that we had on our first Sunday. We want to share that with everyone that is coming to annual conference. And so we are looking for volunteers, and that begins June 9th through June 12th. We are looking for ushers, for greeters. Um, we have a snack bar. We're going to need help with that. We will also have people prepping that food. Uh, Greg and Valerie are the team leads on that. There are a whole lot of incredible opportunities. We encourage you to check out this QR code. If you're struggling with it, that's okay. Go to the church website and you'll just you'll see a similar graphic. Click on it, scroll to the bottom, it says sign in here. If you have questions, please let me know. We would love to just equip everyone to be a part of this incredible opportunity. On June 10th of annual conference, we're going to have an incredible family night out at Quillian, just sharing our resources and having a big old family United Methodist reunion. We would love for you to be a part of that and all of our worship services you are invited to come and be a part of. Also, this is our first Sunday, so it's an incredible opportunity where we extend the table to our community as we collect our canned goods and our food for Lifeline Ministries here and food for our food pantry. So we invite you uh, as you're grocery shopping this week to bring that in so that we can continue to extend our table. At this time, I want to invite our ushers forward for the giving of our tithes and offerings. As they come forward, I invite you and encourage you to fill out the registration pad at the end of your pew. Let us know that you're here and keep your information up to date so that we can stay in touch with you. Let us bow for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for all the blessings that you have placed in our lives, that you are a God of unboundless gifts and grace. As we offer our gifts today, we offer you our love, our devotion, our lives, as well as our gifts. O oh God, bless and multiply these gifts that we offer this morning, that they will do the things in, that your heart longs for your church to do. O oh God, help our eyes to be open to where you would use us, and may we be awakened to your holy presence, now and always. Amen.
Amen. Please be seated. Today we celebrate Holy Communion, and we remember that this table is Christ's table. Christ is the host and invites all who will come to receive of Him, to receive forgiveness of sins, to receive newness of life, to experience resurrection here and now. Christ our Lord invites you, invites all to His table, all who love Him, who earnestly repent of our sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. So I want to invite you to confess your sin with me in this corporate prayer of confession. You can find the words on the screen. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not always loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Would you please stand as we respond? You may be seated as our children are invited to come and meet with Pastor Eric for a children's moment. I guess no one's coming. Oh wait, there are a few. I decided not to use the chair. With the box, it's so much easier to sit all the way on the ground because then I can put the box right there. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. See, they're, they're here. I have a box, and it looks like it's a birthday box. And yes, I keep bringing a box because what's inside? What's inside? When you get a box that looks like this, what is that usually called? A present. High fives. Way to go. A present. What do you think our presents are here today? Any guesses? I have... A wooden cup. Would you hold that? That doesn't seem like much of a present, does it? I have sunglasses. You want to hold those? All right. Yes, you do. And I have a party hat. Who wants to hold the party hat? Yeah, look at that. Okay. And we have the Bible. We always have the Bible in here. One day you'll learn that you can guess the Bible no matter what, because all of these are about a story, right? And the, the scripture is our gift. What do you think a cup and some party glasses and a party hat have to do with our story today? A party. Amen. That's right. Way to go. There is a party. And in just a moment, Pastor Lance is going to read a story. My guess is that you might have heard the story before. Uh, and it's told as a parable. A parable is kind of a fancy way to say uh, like a fairy tale, like once upon a time. Ever heard a fairy tale? Right? They always start with once upon a time, and then they tell us a story, and something happens. Well, this one is a story that goes, once upon a time, there was a father, and he owned a lot of land, and he had two sons. And he had an older son and he had a younger son. And the younger son decided one day that he wanted his inheritance and he wanted to move off and see if he could live life on his own. So he did. And guess what he found? 
He found that he went out and he found friends he could drink with and he could wear sunglasses and a party hat and he could have all the fun in the world until all of his money was gone. Then he had no money left. And so what did he have to do? He needed to work. And then he realized that that work wasn't really what he wanted to do because he was having to feed pigs and that wasn't very good work. So he decided to go home. And when he went home, he was going to tell his father that he didn't deserve to be a son anymore and that he could just work in the fields. But guess what his father did? His father threw a, what do you have? Sunglasses and a party hat and a cup. His father threw a party and when he was a long way off, his father saw him and got a whole party started. And then they invited all their friends and everyone around to come and celebrate because his son, who was lost, was home. And sometimes we tell this story about the son who was lost, but I think today it's really about what? It's really about the party. It's about hope that no matter what you and I do, no matter what mistake we make, guess who's always there to welcome us home? God is. And today we get to celebrate that party. What do we call it? Yeah, high five. Way to go, communion. You probably couldn't hear that. We get to celebrate God's loving forgiveness for us at the table today and celebrate in such a party, right? Where we get to share God's love and grace together. Isn't that amazing? That no matter what we do, we are always invited to the table. No matter what mistakes we've made, God's love is there for us to open his arms and surround us and forgive us. Would you guys pray with me? Dear Lord, we give you thanks for your son who shows us how to love. Help us to share that love with others. Amen. All right, friends, you may head back to your seats. Thank you.
Please remain standing for today's gospel reading from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, as I read, listen for a word from the Lord. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the younger son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And the older son called on one of the slaves and asked what was going on. The slave replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the older son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. The father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Last week marked the beginning of a new season in the life of the church, according to the rhythms of our church here. We began what's called ordinary time, not because it's ho-hum or drab, but because it's marked by an order, a number of weeks, usually between 22 and 26, between now and Christmas. Next week, the pyramids will turn green, and they'll be green for a long time, unless it's a communion Sunday. I love ordinary time, and I almost wish, kind of flipping the meaning of the word on its head, that it was called extraordinary time. And the reason for that is it's this long green season during the long dog days of summer where we get to follow Jesus and learn from His life, His Spirit-filled life, how we are to become fully alive. And so, friends, welcome to Extraordinary Time. Now, throughout this season, we are beginning a new sermon series that will carry us through the end of September, so hold on. We're going to take a deep dive in the Apostles' Creed in a series that we're calling, I Believe, Professing Our Faith for the Apostles' Creed. 1 Peter 3.15 says that we should always be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. We should be able to witness to our faith. And so my hope is that the words of this ancient creed will give you the basis through which you can share your faith with others and come to understand it more fully. I don't just want us learning things about God through this series. I want to make it personal where we begin to experience what it means to profess that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And so, friends, walk with me as we proclaim the gospel through the Apostles' Creed, which we say every Sunday uh, here in this next season. 
Well, there are lots of texts as we begin that I could have picked for our topic. I believe in God the Father Almighty. When we say I, we mean personally I, but also we join in the community in professing. This is the faith of the church. And when we stand and we baptize someone, they profess their faith using the words of this ancient catechism. When we say believe, we place our faith and trust in this word, in the word of the Lord, in the Scriptures, and we commit to follow God with all of our lives. God is Father, Son, and Spirit. We talked about that last Sunday on Trinity Sunday, but what does it mean for us that God is Father? All throughout the Scriptures, God has been called and named Father. In the Old Testament, God has many names, but this parental image comes up time and time again. It's not personal, though, not in the Old Testament. God in the Old Testament is to be far off and revered. God alone is holy, and you can't approach God. And so, you have pictures of God like Moses on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, and there being smoke and fire, and the people have to cleanse themselves and make themselves holy to stand in the presence of God. And yet, we see the personal nature of God in speaking with Moses as a friend would with a friend, and Moses' face would be glowing when he came out of the presence of the Lord. But the the parental image of God is is tied to the people Israel in the Old Testament. Hosea 11.1 says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Here God is father to this nation, this people who are to shine light brightly into the world and draw all people into a relationship with God. Well, when we turn the pages over from the Old Testament to the New, we see Jesus and His relationship with the Father. Jesus was the very Word through which the Father brought all things into being, everything that is and was and ever will be. Next week, we're going to talk about God being the creator of heaven and earth. But this week, I want to focus on the relationship we have with the Father. So, Jesus, when teaching His disciples to pray, teaches us to address God as He does. He said, when you pray, pray in this way. Say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Your name is holy, set apart, and your Father to us. Jesus calling God Father was seen as blasphemous by the religious authorities. That's one of the reasons why they were pursuing Him, to bring Him into line. Because in saying that God is His Father, He's saying that He Himself is God. And I imagine as Jesus heard this charge time and time again, He would say, well, I am, right? Because Jesus is God. But He teaches us to address God just as He did our Father In John's gospel, a little bit later on, Jesus says that in the Son, you see the Father, and in what the Son does, you experience the heart and the nature of the Father. And so, I picked this parable today to illuminate what it means that God is Father to us. There's a series of three parables. Whenever there's three, pay real close attention. That's an important number. And it's said by many that Luke 15 is at the very heart of the gospel. Now, the context is Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees and scribes are grumbling against Jesus because He dares to eat with such dastardly folk. And so, Jesus tells this story, a series of three, to talk about the heart of God. The first is about a shepherd who leaves 99 sheep who are safely in the fold and goes to pursue the one who has wandered away. And upon finding the one, puts the sheep on his shoulders and brings that sheep safely home. The second story is about a woman who has coins but loses one and tears up her whole house, searches top to bottom until she finds the coin, and then goes and tells her neighbors, hey, I found my lost coin, let's celebrate. And the third story is the crown jewel of it all, I think the very center of the gospel something that reflects the heart of God. So many of our Bibles label this heading as the prodigal son, but Jesus tells us it's about a father who has two sons. The story is more about the prodigal father and the way that the father relates to the father's children. We have to understand a little bit about family life in this parable to understand the depth and the power of this story. 
Shame during this day would be heaped upon the father if a son were to come and ask early for an inheritance. It would be like saying, Dad, you're as good as dead to me. Go ahead and divide up the property as it will be when you die, and I want to enjoy all that you've worked your whole life for today. And so from the outset, this story is one that would have evoked an emotional response in the hearer. That's audacious. How could a son ask this of the father? But the father grants the son's request. What we fail to realize is that he divided up the property between his two children at that point. The older son got his share at the same time the younger son did. You wouldn't think so when you get to the end of the story, would you? Because the older son's been out of shape about it all. And yet, that's what happened. The younger son has to convert property into cash in order to travel, and so he quickly sells his share of the property, so now there's less land to farm. Like the, the land that has been in this family for generations has been parceled out and some sold for this younger son to go away, and boy, party did he. I love the party hat, the party glasses earlier, right? He spent every cent of his inheritance, that property that he sold, in lavish living until he had no more. He got to the place where he couldn't even buy food. He had to take a job and for a Jew to feed pigs. He had never eaten bacon before. Jewish people, good Jewish people, weren't supposed to be in the presence of pigs. They were unclean. And yet that's where he found himself. The hearer would have said, well, he's no better than a non-Jewish person outside of the covenant community. He's been cast aside. And yet, even in his darkest moment, he remembers, you know, even the servants in my father's house have it pretty good. You sure they have to work day in and day out, but at least they have three square meals a day. Maybe my father would receive me as a servant, and at least I'd have a bed to sleep in and three meals to eat. And so the younger son takes off toward home. When I was a kid, I uh, was being watched by a babysitter one day, and I was practicing piano, as I was told to do, and the light above the piano started flickering. I was, must have been about 10 at the time, and it was one of those fluorescent tubes. It wasn't covered. It was just exposed. And so I thought, well, I'm going to see. Sometimes you could jiggle it, and it would uh, come back on. It would stop flashing. And so I thought, well, I'm going to solve the problem. I'll just kind of get a chair, and I'll stand up and, and fix the bulb. Well, I, uh, I fixed it all right. It came crashing down and broke into a bajillion bits all over the piano. Dust went everywhere. Glass was all over the keys, in the keys. The babysitter heard what happened and came running in, and we got it cleaned up mostly. She helped. And I was terrified of what my parents would think. I, you know, even at 10, I knew it was just a light bulb, but it was what it represented, right? I shouldn't have taken matters into my own hands to try to fix it. And I should have waited until they got home and asked for help. And I knew that I had messed up. And so I waited for the sound of the car on the driveway, and as soon as the door opened before my parents could even get into the living room uh, where the piano was, I confessed to them. I said, I, I have to tell you something. I, I broke the light bulb above the piano. Glass went everywhere. We tried to clean it up as best we could, but I'm really sorry. And I was expecting, you know, how could you? But instead, my parents both hugged me and said, thank you for telling us the truth. We're not mad. We appreciate that you did your best to clean it up. And I felt in that moment it was undeserved grace, and I'd never felt so loved. Such is the heart of the father in this story. When the, the son is quite a distance away, the father who's watching on the horizon sees the son coming and runs to him. This was also another shameful act in this culture to see the father advanced in years running toward his, his younger son who had shamed him. And before the son could even get the words out that I have sinned against heaven and before you, the father scoops him up in his arms, embraces him, and orders his servants, quick, go get our finest robe and the best sandals. Get the ring out of the lockbox and kill the fatted calf. He throws a party. He throws a party to celebrate that this son that was as good as dead is now alive again. This parable is offensive to some who hear it, certainly to the Pharisees who were mad that Jesus was eating with such rabble-rousers. And yet, 
isn't the response to generosity celebration? Isn't it gratitude? Shouldn't there be a huge party when somebody comes from death to life, when somebody returns to the Father? Such as the rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents and turns from their sin. And yet, sometimes the church expects bread and water, sackcloth instead of a fine robe. Sure, you've been a sinner and you're returning. Here's a little bread and water. Why don't you wear some itchy clothes and wallow around in it for a while? Sometimes we, like the Pharisees and the scribes, think that the reception should fit the crime. And yet, that's not the heart of the Father at all. The heart of the Father is gratitude, a generosity that elicits gratitude from those who have been welcomed home. When I was younger, I used to clean up trash on the beach that was near where I lived. And I was always amazed on those days that we were doing beach cleanup how much garbage was on the beach. And I never realized until I was done that there was, what was the Gulf of Mexico and in and around Matagorda, but even still it was beautiful, right? There was this great surf and I missed it because I was looking at all the trash I was picking up. Well, that's the older brother in the story. He had been given everything equal to the younger son. He had gotten his share of the inheritance at the same time. The father comes out to the older son just as he did to the younger son. This is a father that that gives generously to all of his children. But the older brother is furious. This son of yours squandered everything you had worked for. You hadn't even so much as killed the fatted calf for me to celebrate with my friends. And the father says, whoa, we've been partners. You own property. We do this together. Everything I have has been yours. Yet today we celebrate because this brother of yours was lost and now he's found. Sometimes we feel like the older brother. We've been doing this for a while, and no one's ever gone to this much effort for us. This was the Pharisees listening to the story that Jesus was telling, and they were feeling left out. Wait a second, you're eating with them. What about us? And Jesus is telling them, you'll have a place at this table already. Why don't you come and join us? You see, we forget when we've been doing this for a while about the generosity of the Father. Friends, the good news of this story about our God is that our God is a pursuing God. When we wander away, there is no place too far, no corner too dark, where the Father will not seek us out and find us and place us on His shoulders like a shepherd returning a sheep to the fold and bring us safely home. Even in this day and age, to to have a God, little g God, from the nations that welcomes a sinner, well, that wouldn't have been such a foreign concept. But to have a God who would go out and pursue a sinner in order to bring one of us safely back, well, that was more lavish and extravagant than any conception of God had ever been. But friends, this is our Father in heaven whose name is Holy. And so know that God loves you. As John would later write in his letter, 1 John, God is love, and it's God's nature to pursue you even to the inner depths, the darkest portion of your soul, the depth and darkness of your grief. There's no place too far, no place that you can wander where the Lord will not pursue you to bring you safely back. Friends, God has prepared for us a feast where saint and sinner alike are welcome to come to the celebration a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. I hope you will come and know that our merciful Father will forgive you, will receive you, and will pull out the chair to invite you to your place at the table. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and God of mercy, the love you have shown us in Jesus is more than we deserve and more than we can imagine. Your arm, remind us that your arms are open wide, like a waiting father for his prodigal children, ready to welcome and restore. Oh God, for those of us who feel distanced or out of reach of this gracious love and mercy, help us to hear this ancient story this morning as a reminder of your love for us here and now today. 
Help us to hear and know that the invitation is for each of us. Oh God, for those of us who continue to walk with Jesus faithfully, help us to celebrate the immeasurable grace and mercy that you continue to pour out. Help us to continue to make room at the banqueting table for each of your beloved. Oh God, as we come to the table today, may we be reminded of your continued mercy and grace that you pour out for us. Grant that we may then go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we're preparing the table for Holy Communion and preparing our hearts to receive Jesus once again, I invite you to stand as we sing the first three verses of Amazing Grace and make these words your prayer today to God. Let us stand. seated. Will you join me in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from captivity to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, 
we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one, one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would those helping to serve communion please come forward at this time? now ready. Won't you come? So glad I could just serve.
that doesn't reflect the heart of the Father that we were talking about earlier. I don't know what does. Well, friends, we end each one of our communion services by praying the Lord's Prayer in song. So I want to invite you to stand. You can grab the hand of somebody next to you or across the aisle if you wish as we pray this prayer together. You'll notice Pastor Eric is not here. He is left for the party. If you did not hear about the party, there's a pool party at Quillian today from noon to four. It is not too late to pick up a subway or just head over there. They have great concession food until four o'clock today. Again, a fun, free pool party to go and just enjoy the afternoon with your church family. If you missed this date and you already have plans, know that there is two more coming up, June 30th and August 18th, so make sure you make plans for that. As I shared earlier, it is for first Sunday food drive, so I encourage you and remind you to pick up extra groceries for our neighbors in the weeks ahead. Also, we have an all-youth mission trip for all those who have completed 6th through 12th grade coming up this summer. Check your newsletter and check uh, or communicate with Pastor Eric if you would like more information. Well, friends, as that beautiful community anthem reminds us, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Come home. Come home. There's no place you can wander, no darkness too dark, where God will not seek you out and find you and bring you safely home. Friends, go forth sharing this good news everywhere you go. Go forth today and every day and be the church. Amen.